Hello everyone, this video will talk about abnormal hemoglobin in a very, very brief manner. The abnormality of a hemoglobin may depend on which part is affected. It may be that only the heme portion is affected. It may also be that only the globin chain is affected. And it's also possible that the whole hemoglobin is dysfunctional. The first one is porphyrias. Porphyrias are disorders of the heme synthesis. So this means that only the heme part of the hemoglobin is affected. Hemoglobinopathy and thalassemias, on the other hand, have the globin chain as being abnormal. And lastly, dyshemoglobins are dysfunctional hemoglobins as a whole. The first one is porphyria, and these are diseases that are characterized by the impaired production of heme. There is a heme defect. The globin portion of the hemoglobin, the globin chains, are all normal, while the heme portion are abnormal. Now, these are usually caused when there is a deficiency or a defect on the enzymes that are used in heme synthesis or when we produce heme. Now, the term porphyria is used because these conditions lead to an increase of porphyrins or porphyrinogens, and these accumulation would cause a decrease in normal hemoglobin. Remember, the main function of hemoglobin is to be able to carry oxygen, and oxygen is attached to the heme portion of the hemoglobin. So if there is a defect in the heme, oxygen will not attach to hemoglobin. Therefore, the hemoglobin will not be able to perform its normal function. Porphyrias are conditions that are actually rare. There's not much people with them, and they can either be inherited or they can also be acquired from the environment. Now, porphyrias have something to do with the heme production pathway or the heme biosynthesis, and we have explained this in our hemoglobin structure video. We have mentioned there that the initial stage and the last three stages all happen in the mitochondria of the RBC and the middle stages happen in the cytoplasm. Now there are other references, I don't want you to be confused, that use porphyrin in this stage, which is actually okay because protoporphyrin 9 is a classification of porphyrin. It is a derivative of porphyrin, but since our reference is Rodax hematology, we will stick with protoporphyrin 9. Now, porphyrias are caused because of the defective enzymes that are involved in the heme biosynthesis pathway. Therefore, porphyrias are named according to the enzyme which is defective or deficient. So, for example, a defect in the ALA dehydrase will now be called as ALA deficient porphyria. And an Enzyme, which is defective uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, will be named as a porphyria cutana tarda, and so on and so forth. Now, an example of an acquired porphyria is lead poisoning. And lead poisoning can disrupt or can affect ALA synthase. So it makes it defective and it can also affect ferrochelatase. So it affects both of these enzymes. And ferrochelatase is the enzyme that adds the ferrous iron to protoporphyrin 9 so that it can be a complete and a functional heme. Let's now proceed with the second type of abnormal hemoglobin, which has something to do with the globin chain. So for these, the heme portion is normal while the globin chain is abnormal. And there are two types. We have hemoglobinopathies and thalassemia. Let's now differentiate the two of them very briefly. Hemoglobinopathies are qualitative abnormalities while thalassemias are quantitative abnormalities. So this 
is more on the structural abnormality for hemoglobinopathy. That means there is an altered structure. While in thalassemia, it's more on the quantity or the number of globin chains. So the structure of thalassemia is normal. It's just that there is not enough globin chains. Next one is that both of them have genetic mutations. They have genetic defects. It's just that the genetic defect for a hemoglobinopathy has something to do with the amino acid alteration. They can either be deleted or they can be substituted, thereby giving a different structure for the globin chain. While in thalassemia, the genetic defect causes a reduced or the absence of the production of the globin chain. In hemoglobinopathy, we have different hemoglobin variants. And in thalassemia, it actually came from two Greek words, thalasso and hemia, which is in reference for anemia of the sea. Just to give examples of the different globin chain abnormalities, let's start with the hemoglobinopathies. We have hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. Hemoglobin S is also known as the sickle cell anemia. And as mentioned earlier, hemoglobinopathies in general have an alteration in the amino acid sequence. So for sickle cell anemia, the amino acid being altered is the glutamic acid. So in the sixth position of the globin chain, glutamic acid was changed into valine and this can cause a severe hemolytic anemia because there was a structural defect there was a structural change hemoglobin s is the most common hemoglobinopathy hemoglobin c is also known as hemoglobin c disease and for the amino acid it's also the sixth position in the globin chain which is glutamic acid but this time it was changed into lysine and this can cause a mild chronic hemolytic anemia. Both hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C are predominant in African descent individuals. Let's now proceed with thalassemia. Thalassemias are named according to the chain which is reduced or which is absent during synthesis. So we have alpha thalassemia for the alpha chain being affected and beta thalassemia for the beta chain being affected. So we also have gamma chain, gamma chain, uh, gamma thalassemia, and so on and so forth. In alpha thalassemia, there is a genetic mutation in chromosome 16 and in beta thalassemia there is a genetic mutation in chromosome 11. There are different types of alpha thalassemia. There's four and there are different types of beta thalassemia as well. But just to give an example, for alpha thalassemia we have hemoglobin Bart hydrops fetalis. Now this is a condition where all of the alpha chains are missing. There are no alpha chains and this causes death in utero, meaning the fetus does not survive, it dies in the womb. Sometimes they get born, but there is a very slim chance of them surviving because they have a condition where they are incompatible with life. An example of beta thalassemia is beta thalassemia major and this can cause severe anemia which requires regular transfusion therapy for the patient. Now both alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia are the most clinically significant. Again they are the most clinically significant. Why? Because an adult hemoglobin, hemoglobin A, is made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains. So when there is a defect on each, which is a major adult hemoglobin, there can be problems. And the last type of an abnormal hemoglobin is dishemoglobins. They are named as such because they are dysfunctional hemoglobins. They do not function properly because they are unable to transport oxygen. Now, these hemoglobins occur because of the accumulation of certain drugs, chemicals, or gases 
into toxic levels and this can cause a modification in the structure of the hemoglobin now unlike thalassemia and hemoglobinopathy that are usually inherited these hemoglobins are mostly acquired and only a small fraction of them are hereditary Let's give examples of the different dishemoglobins, and we will discuss methemoglobin, self-hemoglobin, and carboxyhemoglobin. Let's start with methemoglobin, which is also abbreviated as methHB. It is also known as hemoglobin. Methemoglobin forms because of the heme iron being oxidized to the ferric iron. Now, the heme iron supposed to be is the ferrous iron and as we know oxygen only binds to the ferrous state of iron and if this is changed into the ferric iron then that means that this hemoglobin cannot carry oxygen because oxygen cannot bind to ferric iron now normally there is around 1% of methemoglobin which is present due to the continuous formation during the normal oxygenation and deoxygenation of hemoglobin. So when there is an increase in methemoglobin, that would result in the decreased transport of oxygen to the tissue. If the percentage of methemoglobin is less than 25 percent patients are usually asymptomatic they don't see anything they don't really feel anything but if it increases to more than 30 percent then there will be cyanosis and some symptoms of hypoxia cyanosis is the bluish discoloration of the skin and this is due to the low oxygen delivery to these parts of the body and this and it usually appears in the lips and the fingers first cyanosis comes from the greek word cyanos which means blue and then for the symptoms of hypoxia this can either be dyspnea headache vertigo and sometimes there can even be a change in the mental status and if the methemoglobin rises to more than 50% of the total hemoglobin, then this can lead to coma and death. An increase in methemoglobin is called methemoglobinemia, and this can either be acquired or hereditary. But another term given to the acquired form is toxic methemoglobinemia and this is due to the exposure of the individual to exogenous chemicals like nitrites, primaquine, dapsone, or benzocaine. The second type of this hemoglobin is self-hemoglobin abbreviated as self-HB and this results from the exposure to different sulfur chemicals that can come from the environmental or industrial settings. Self-hemoglobin forms when sulfur atoms bind to the heme portion of the hemoglobin, and this binding will make oxygen transport ineffective. Unlike methemoglobin, self-hemoglobin is irreversible. That means it cannot revert back to being a normal hemoglobin. This type of hemoglobin will persist in the entire life of the cell. Again, methemoglobin is reversible while self-hemoglobin is irreversible. Examples of drugs that cause the irreversible oxidation of the hemoglobin would be sulfonylamides, phenacetin, nitrites, and phenylhydrazine. If there are elevated levels of self-hemoglobin, there can be cyanosis experienced by the patient. The third and last type of this hemoglobin is carboxyhemoglobin, abbreviated as COHB. Now this forms when carbon monoxide binds with the heme iron of hemoglobin. So instead of oxygen binding to the heme iron, it would be carbon monoxide. Now this is dangerous because carbon monoxide has 240 times more affinity than oxygen. So it basically robs the opportunity for oxygen to bind with hemoglobin. Carbon monoxide is termed as a silent killer because this gas is both odorless, so that means it doesn't have any smell, and it is also colorless. That's why detecting the presence of this kind of gas in the surrounding or in the environment would be very difficult. 
patients who are poisoned with carbon monoxide become hypoxic very, very fast or very quickly. Examples of exogenous um, sources for carbon monoxide would be the exhaust from automobiles, tobacco smoke, and industrial pollutants. Examples of industrial pollutants that have carbon monoxide will be coal, gas, and charcoal burning. So you have to be careful with these kinds of environment. This explains why, why smokers have an increased 15% more presence of carboxyhemoglobin. That's why smokers have a high hematocrit level and are polycythemic so that they can compensate for the hypoxia brought about by carboxyhemoglobin. We are now done with the discussion about abnormal hemoglobin. So again, this is just a basic discussion. I hope you understand everything. Hope you learned a lot. Thank you very much for watching.